Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Dr. Lisa Greenhill. I'm the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. Today, I am delighted to finally, finally have the show that we've rescheduled a couple of times uh, featuring Melissa Sheck, who is the recent, most recent recipient of the Patricia Lowry Diversity Leadership Award. She is also a recent graduate of the University of Wisconsin. Of course, we are also joined by the namesake of the uh, wonderful award, Ms. Lowry. Hello, hello, hello. Good, af- good afternoon. Hi. Good to see you. Good yes, see you. yes, yes. So we will uh, get on into this starting about 10 years ago, the award, um, the Lowry Diversity Leadership Award, uh, recognizes the contributions of veterinary students who demonstrate leadership in the advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion on their campus. Melissa joins a very small but mighty group of veterinarians who um, have been recognized for their advocacy and making a difference while in veterinary school. So belated, but very much congratulations, Melissa. Thank you so much. (laughs) Yes, yes, welcome. So Melissa, why don't uh, we get started and you uh, share a little bit about yourself. Sure, thank you so much for having me on the podcast, Lisa. Um, And it's a pleasure to actually finally meet Ms. Lowry. Um, We spoke on the phone earlier and it's nice to be able to put a face to a name. So I'm very grateful for all the generosity that you've shown, um, not just myself, but everyone from, um, you know, everyone who's interested in diversity. So my name is Melissa Sheff. I recently graduated, as Lisa mentioned, from the University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I'm currently enrolled in the MPH program um, through the dual degree program here at the university. Um, And I am very excited to be speaking on this podcast with both of you. Awesome, awesome. And Pat. Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, let me add uh, my congratulations uh, to Melissa as well. Um, we did have an opportunity to speak and we had an exciting conversation. Uh, and it's always interesting to try and reproduce that uh, when one is called to do it. Um, you know, f- f- that's not kind of a rehearsal or a meet or greet that type of thing but uh, i am thrilled um, to be able to meet the recipient Um, the honor of that um, holds my name and and that i i must humbly say uh, reflects i believe the uh, progress that the veterinary profession in general and veterinary medical education specifically is making uh, towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I'm a retiree, um, executive consultant, I guess I should quickly add, um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, working many, many years towards uh, facilitating uh, the interests and aspirations of young people who are pursuing uh, specifically veterinary medicine and in general, the health professions, um, folks who are generally thought of as being underrepresented in those professions, uh, doing whatever I can, hopefully uh, by definition, making good trouble uh, towards that aim. And so um, I thank you also, Lisa, for your current and Star, storied work um, in the profession, uh, trying to, to labor in this vineyard, uh, making whatever progress we can make inch by inch, 
sometimes mile by mile. So thank you also, Lisa, for your, your diligence uh, and hard work. Well, thank you. Um, I, uh, you are one of my most favorite people um, in the whole world. Um, and uh, I know that there are definitely many, many days that I have not been, <laughs> that I have wanted to crawl out of this vineyard. <laughs> But for you, <laughs> your your sage wisdom and uh, your off ledge talking and the whole bit. Um, but yeah, uh, you know it's it is um, Melissa. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And we do. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and I am definitely a fan of giving folks their flowers while they <laughs> enjoy them. So. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So let's go ahead and dig in. So yes. now that you're not, well, I guess you're still there, but you are now, <laughs> Dr. Chef. Uh, so Melissa, you were really, really active um, during your DBM studies. So, you know, tell us how you kind of got into it and, and really some of the things that you were involved in uh, while you were earning your DBM. Yes. I, so I guess my foray into diversity and equity and inclusion work, I'd say began um, even before I started veterinary school. And so coming into that school, I had the advantage of already being a little bit experienced, a little bit practiced in working um, in this really, really rewarding field. And so for me, transitioning into some of the leadership positions during veterinary school that allowed me to further cultivate my appreciation for diversity, equity, and inclusion, that was a, a smooth transition for me. Um, and it was one that I had intended all along. So I know for a lot of people, sometimes it just falls into their lap. And um, for me, I intentionally sought out opportunities and experiences that would uh, help me further educate myself. Okay, so, so would you, oh yes, Pat, looks like you were about to plan. Yes, uh, because I believe I, I have a cheat sheet, uh, having had a wonderful conversation with Melissa. Melissa, uh, we know something because of your application and your nomination, but uh, you've alluded to it in, in your last in, uh, the response. Uh, to Lisa's question, but uh, share a little bit about your personal history that we really won't find in all of your application materials that make that made this such a smooth transition as as you described it. Yeah, of course. Um, yes, because I have you know I have a, kind of like a, a resume of sorts, if you will, of of the experiences that. I've had, but they don't really kind of go into what made me so passionate about diversity in the first place. And I think what you're trying to get at is uh, my family and my cultural background, which has really played a hugely important role in um, helping me develop a vocabulary, helping me develop conversations about diversity. And um, I 100% attribute that to uh, my very unique ethnic background. I am half Indian and half Cuban. Both my parents are immigrants, uh, first generation Americans. And um, I really benefited growing up from the richness of both cultures. Um, and so I think having been raised in an environment that was just a really unique blend of different cultures and traditions and languages and you know, values and belief systems, um, that from a very young age helped me set a worldview that is I think a little bit different from what others might have experienced. So I think, I think that really helped me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, that um, you know, uh, uh, culture, um, personal identity can be so 
uh, flexibles can be so hard to interpret, I think, externally when we're kind of just going on how folks appear, right? And so we always know that there's kind of a story under there that kind of explains at what least one story. I'm sorry? I said at least one story. Sometimes there are many stories. Many <laughs> stories. Yes, there's, yes, there's many stories. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so those things are, are really important. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it, it does, um, you know, knowing that about you, I can kind of maybe gather how you develop that vocabulary. These are things that you kind of maybe grew up with. Yes. Yeah, to some extent. And it's also, as I alluded to earlier, a little bit of an active learning commitment on my part too. It's something that, you know, I don't necessarily think that you are necessarily born into a, a family or a community that is equipped or has access mm -hmm. to be able to um, talk about these things and kind of have these conversations like we are having right now. Um, and it's, so, so it's one that was a stepping stone for me and helped launch me into where I am now. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Wonderful. So we know that you're involved in Whisk Cares, which um, yes. for long, 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 long time listeners of the podcast, we go way back into the dark ages of the podcast, you will know that the very first episode of this show <laughs> actually featured the founder <laughs> of Whiskers, um, uh, William Gillis. And so, uh, yeah, why don't you tell us how you got involved in, in Whiskers and, and what did you do there? Talk us a little bit, tell us a little bit about the program. Of course, um, you know, I, I love Dr. Gillis. I think, um, you know, considering that this has been something that's been referenced on your podcast before, maybe viewers are already aware um, but just to reiterate, WISCARE stands for Wisconsin Companion Animal Resources Education and Social Services. Um, it is an outreach, currently an outreach partnership uh, at, through the University of Wisconsin, whose goal is to provide basic veterinary care, housing support, advocacy, support services, social services to Dane County pet owners who are primarily low income, um, currently experiencing or at risk of homelessness, uh, generally disadvantaged populations or system, uh, systemically oppressed populations here in Dane County. Um, and so I first started working with WISC Cares in 2017 when I first got into veterinary school. It was a program that I'd heard about, I think at a lunch meeting at school and immediately I connected to it and I connected to the, the beliefs and mission statements and, and values that were inherent to this organization. Um, so I started out as just a volunteer and that gradually evolved into um, a volunteer coordinator position. So I helped coordinate um, with other veterinarians in the area who would be willing to volunteer their time and their skills to help out with the program. And then that evolved eventually into um, me serving as a clinic administrator for WISCARES. Um, so I was part of a team of, I think it was four or five students, um, different years in veterinary school and kind of all from different paths and, and walks of life. And our job was to work with William, work with Levi Sable, is our head social service coordinator um, to work with you know the people who were really involved from the beginning with making this program great at enhancing it even further and making sure that we're really catering to the population that we're claiming to serve um, and that was a very exciting transition for me for a couple of reasons firstly I'd never been involved in administration before so for me it was very very different from you know actually volunteering my skills as a you know veterinary student um, to going behind the scenes and looking at how a clinic or a hospital is run uh, so that was a very interesting learning experience for me, but I think it also gave me a bit more perspective about the community that we serve and the clients' needs that, that we're hoping to address. Um, and that's something that I have been able to take with me. So 
even though I, um, you know, left my position as clinic administrator at the end of my third year, right when I started my rotations, um, I, I did uh, decide to pursue a rotation at WISCARES to see how things would be like uh, kind of from the other side. And I can't even begin to describe how incredibly fulfilling it was for me to um, come back, you know, at the end of the year of my fourth year, having been away for a year and, and just see how much growth mm. has happened um, at that institution. And I, I couldn't be more proud of, of everything that, you know, everyone who's been involved in all of, all of the work in helping transition WISCARES from a small, you know, out of a, out of a trailer clinic to a actual facility with a full service hospital. It's just, it's been extremely gratifying. So I've, I guess my WISCARES experience has kind of been a backbone of my veterinary school mm. experience. Mm. That's so, that's so cool. And WISCARES is really an amazing program. I'd love to, you know, see it replicated other places. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that, that, you know, certainly Pat and I have been talking about the need for us to really think about how does the profession serve marginalized communities very yes. broadly, right? Yes. And, I, and yes. And that's one of the things that I love about the program. When I, when, when I was hired back at AAVMC to, to launch Diversity Matters, you know, we were just talking about race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were just talking about race. Um, and then it got expanded to gender. And, and certainly, you know, it's grown dramatically over, over the years. But this need for us to really kind of think Frankly, more complexly, more more in more complex ways yes. about yes. marginalization, right. um, forgotten communities, oppression, and what that that looks like. You know, uh, there's a real need for us to to think about that. Um, any, any comments, Pat? <laughs> oh yes. Uh, in fact, uh, this was one of the areas that Melissa and I actually explored in our previous conversation. Um, and now that she has completed her veterinary training and has, um, uh, well, not initiated, but certainly is now trying to complete her graduate work, we talked about the, as I recall, the, the ability of her specifically being able to merge all of her experiences, not just uh, that ethnic um, duality that she lives uh, as as a complete entity in and of itself, uh, but um, her interest in whiskers and serving the underserved, and although she hasn't said it today, her interest in international uh, work, uh, and we thought, what if we could talk more specifically about the domestic. A potential for One Health. Um, and certainly WISCARE gives yeah. you that opportunity more than any other specific program uh, that's part of an academic institution. Uh, and so I, I, Melissa now has had, I believe, probably more than an opportunity to think about the public health piece, the domestic piece, the urban outreach opportunity and also looking at what the parallels are for the international underserved populations and One Health and the domestic One Health opportunities. And so Melissa, can you, I'm putting you on the spot. I realize that, but I don't believe I'm throwing you a curveball. <laughs> no, absolutely. You're not throwing me a curveball. Um, I do recall this being kind of a topic of our conversation. And I think that you know, I think there's a part of me that's still very much drawn to, to big things and changing the world and all of that. Um, but I am really interested in exploring local ways of generating change. And I think having seen how Whiskers was able to do that, how, you know, William Gillis was able to do that through his vision um, is something of an inspiration for me. And so that's something, that's a partnership that I'm really hoping to explore uh, while I'm working on my master's of public health. 
degree um, because I think that that will be a wonderful opportunity for me to see what things are available here that I can help in that change in, um, in a real tangible way and maybe see a little bit more gratifying results than if you know I try to bite off more than I can chew, so to speak. <laughs> So you talked about being uh, an administrator and kind of seeing things, you know, backstage, if you will. What was the most challenging uh, part of hospital administration um, with this particular, you know, in, in this particular um, um, environment with with these populations? Is it, you know, what what was most challenging, but what what was also most rewarding? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. It's kind of a tough question. Um, I think, you know, I think some of the administrative challenges are ones that, you know, administrators anywhere in any kind of department and any kind of service providing department can probably relate to things like bureaucracy and funding and, um, you know, legal issues and, and stuff like that. Um, I think maybe one of the things that was unique to WISC Cares and that I was working really hard along with my colleagues to help address were the multiple needs of our clients um, because we are a really interesting, WISC Cares is a really interesting um, organization that is attempting to bridge One Health. Um, and so what that means is that our clients are often coming to us with all kinds of different needs. And um, for me, I feel most comfortable serving their veterinary needs. Um, that's kind of my, my comfort zone. That's what I'm educated in. And less so in issues of social service. Um, so things regarding specifically housing, finding housing in Dane County, um, dealing with issues of domestic violence, dealing with issues, issues of abuse, um, trauma, I'd say, is, was a really big thing that, you know, nobody teaches you about in, in veterinary school, um, but it's something that I frequently saw in my clients and reflected in, um, you know, even just routine visits that I would have with them. And whether that was generational trauma or trauma experienced by, you know, a crisis, a personal crisis or, or something like that. So for me, it was really important that we train people, those people who are providing services in ways that can help address some of those issues. Um, at the same time, acknowledging that, you know, me specifically, I'm not educated in dealing with that. And so, you know, I might not be the best person or resource to go to when there are questions of, um, you know, things going on at home. Um, and so I think that was one thing that I personally really struggled with was the difference between providing veterinary advice and then also providing support and advice to people who needed it in other ways, but that I wasn't necessarily qualified to give. Um, and so working with my colleagues, other providers, um, trying to take advantage of everyone's different skill sets and everything that they were bringing to make sure that we were providing the best service possible to, to our clients was, you know, that was, that was a challenge. Um, but it was also a really good learning experience. And, you know, it, it kind of was its own reward because once we were able to see ways in which we could work together as a team across these different areas of One Health, it became a lot easier to manage some of these cases. Lisa, can you give us a specific example of where all of those kinds of things came together that heightened your awareness? Sure. Um, so obviously I can't be too specific because no, I'm just that, that. Yes. <laughs> but um, so for example, um, I remember there was this one time that I had a client who, uh, first of all, there was a huge language barrier because she didn't speak English. She spoke Spanish. And um, actually, I do speak Spanish, but um, conversationally uh, and medical Spanish is pretty different <laughs> for me. 
uh, at least. Um, and so even just right there, like once she saw that I could speak Spanish, there was a level of trust that was built. But then there was still a little bit of a gap because I wasn't able to effectively use words the way I wanted to use them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to maintain this trust and at the same time get her, you know, the help that she needed. So I actually ended up coordinating with um, another student who spoke better Spanish than I and was able to kind of assist this client a little bit better and I think more in a more nuanced way than I would have been um, and in talking to this client it was revealed that uh, she was on the verge of experiencing homelessness because she was um, having an animal a pet dog in her home um, who she loved dearly but who was not allowed on the premises according to like her landlord's agreement um, and that's not something that's terribly uncommon here, unfortunately. Um, and so the next step was, you know, I know nothing about housing laws or <laughs> regulations or anything like that. So the next step for me was then to go find, you know, someone in social services who did know that. Um, and, you know, it involves multiple steps. It involved me coming out of the exam room, finding someone to talk to, telling them the situation. Um, and then that, you know, a social service student was able to help me come up with a list of um, alternative housing ideas and alternative methods of potentially getting around that, that rule. So it was a really interesting, you know, it was a little bit of insight into how our, our legal system works and, and loopholes and things like that. Um, but then being able to communicate that back to her, you know, also involved a, a bit of a translation service. Um, and, you know, she, I don't think fully understood exactly what was happening. And I don't know whether that was because we weren't explaining things appropriately or, or what. Some, sometimes, you know, we have clients of a variety of experiences and education backgrounds. Um, and, you know, this stuff <laughs> goes way over my head too, so <laughs> can't blame people. Um, and, you know, I think being able to have bring someone else in to kind of offer additional support long term, that was what really helped her get through this. Um, because again, it would have been one thing if we just handed her a list of, of options and then said, good luck, have fun with this, <laughs> you know, get back to us if it doesn't work. And another thing for her to have um, someone here who was accountable for her case and, and who could follow up on, on that with her. So it ended up working out in the end, we were able to get her animal registered as an emotional support animal. And then um, we were able to get a doctor to, to write a note saying that, you know, that this was an animal that had been, um, you know, had received all the appropriate medical treatment, was not a risk to others. And um, it ended up getting getting approved by, by the land. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah. I, I think that, that, you know, the thing <clears throat> about that program and programs like it really humanizes folks and it allows, you know, a lot of times we hear about these stories, right? But um, it's very rare that um, students have an opportunity to kind of be in the kind of dropped into it to, and also be um, responsible for helping to find some types of solutions to actually provide aid more than what that immediate training is, right? And it really does hopefully sensitize folks to um, the, that the needs of the population broadly are vast, right? And that, that there's just it, there's a lot more. It, it, it's very easy for all folks, you know, I've heard folks over the years say, ah, well, those people just should not have pets, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. The infamous those, right? Um, but but uh, life is a lot more, always more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah. it is and a lot the, more complicated. And the intersectionality yeah. of of all of those things, the economic, yeah. the cultural, yeah. um, 
uh, and especially as we come out of the worst public health um, events that we've all experienced in the last 18 to 24 months. Um, it, it really does bring to focus the role of veterinary medicine uh, in a way that uh, we, we might not have otherwise imagined. You hate for such awareness to come out of tragedy uh, in the way that it has. Uh, but veterinary medicine in a lot of ways has truly become the canary uh, in this coal mine that we just, well, we haven't finished experiencing it yet, but hopefully there is a light literally yes. at the end of this tunnel. Uh, and um, there are going to be hopefully more ways to appreciate um, the role of veterinary medicine, veterinary medical education will change certainly because of it. But most importantly, I hope our graduates will see themselves as change agents yeah. uh, for the future uh, of this profession that uh, is not only rewarding in and of itself, but uh, society has so underjudged it um, for its full capacity uh, to bring um, comfort, um, security, uh, as well as uh, growth uh, for uh, equity um, in, in this country specifically and by translation uh, globally. So we're looking for Melissa and her classmates uh, to be the carriers of that message uh, and to breathe those change agents moving the profession forward in that way. I think it's really important that you brought that up, Pat, because, you know, more and more I'm hearing from my classmates and, and I think we're coming to an understanding that veterinary medicine does not exist in a bubble. It does not exist in isolation of everything else. Um, and, you know, I think, like you mentioned, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic really highlighted that for at least people in my class, because we were providing care to, to people in, you know, I was, we were in our rotations in the middle of the pandemic um, and providing care to people in a, in a pretty unprecedented way. Um, and so people are coming out of that experience, realizing, wow, you know, when I'm a general practitioner, I am not just here to give the vaccines and to have the talk about spaying and neutering, there's a lot more that, that goes into what, you know, the decision that a person makes about bringing their pet to the vet in the first place, about, you know, financially what they're capable of affording, um, diagnostically what you want to do, but a client does not want or is unable to pay for. Um, accessibility is a huge thing. Um, and, and so I think more and more people are becoming attuned to that. Um, I do wish that was more a part of the veterinary medicine curriculum in general. And I can't speak for other uh, institutions, um, but I, I do think that it is important to be raising these points before people are graduating, uh, because it can be a bit of a shock to, to go right into practice and realize, wow, you know, I was educated in how to do this surgery, but not in how to talk to people about, you know, some difficult issues. And so <laughs> that's one of the, the greatest things about Whispers is that we had the opportunity to do that. And um, out of my classmates who I know did a rotation there, well, for one thing, it was extremely difficult to get a rotation there because everyone wanted to do that. And I think that's part of the reason why was because that, you know, was one of the few opportunities we had during our fourth year to actually practice, um, you know, in a safe space with all the resources and all the support, um, actually, actually helping people as people as a whole um, and their animals. Oh, that's so great. And I, I think that, um... You know, I do hope that more folks think about kind of these intersections in the One Health and, and what does all of this mean? It, it reminds me, I mean, I've long thought that, you know, like even if it's just a card, cheats cheat on 
depression screenings and domestic violence screenings and those kinds of things. Just, you know, there can be a cheat sheet in the, in the back office, but it needs to be there. And, and you know, it just re reminds me that, I mean, I live just outside of Washington, D.C. And, and um, in the weeks after 9-11, the dog that I had was very lethargic and blue and, you know, it was just really tough. And um, at the time I was working for a nursing organization and it was one of those, one of my rotation, my boomerang rotations off uh, out of veterinary medicine. Um, but uh, I just recall that the veterinarian, Dr. Marsico, starts asking me these questions. And I was like, hey, I work for a nursing organization. I recognize these questions. You're doing a depression screening. She was like, yeah, because your dog is is sad because you're sad. Like, you're sad. Like, <laughs> the world just blew up. Like, and like, you've experienced trauma and the dog is like reflecting that. And I was like, huh, okay, so you might be right. Like, you know, but it, it, it was enough of, I mean, she wasn't going to fix that problem, but it was enough to give me a heads up that to know that I needed to go seek some assistance in dealing with the trauma of 9-11, right? And so, um, so that moment to me is just one of those kind of um, uh, crucible moments for me and the profession kind of thinking about what's possible, right? What's possible. And so, um, so Melissa, you've got a bit of a teaching bug though. So, you know, in your application, I heard you built out a whole curriculum called People. I did. Well, so I didn't, and, you know, <laughs> I didn't so invent it. People. <laughs> um, <laughs> people, so that stands for uh, the Pre-College Enrichment Opportunity Program for Learning Excellence. It's a program uh, through our diversity office here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, and it is specifically designed so students in primarily Milwaukee, but in some um, Madison regions as well, um, will apply as eighth graders to the program. And then they'll complete a series of um, academic programs throughout um, their high school careers that with the ultimate goal of helping them get into college. And the, the targeted audience for this particular program are people from low income, first generation uh, college students um, and, and um, otherwise socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds um, or backgrounds that have been traditionally overlooked by our education system in general. Um, and so I had the honor of serving as an internship instructor um, in 2019 uh, for the um, advanced high school um, people internship course. And I decided to teach on veterinary medicine <laughs> because that's what I know. And um, I had a wonderful class of, I think it was 12 student, 12 or 13 students. Um, and I designed a four week full-time curriculum for them on different topics in veterinary medicine. Um, and, you know, my goal at first, it was, okay, everyone's going to come out of this program wanting to be a vet. It's going to be great. And then as the program went on, you know, I realized as long as I'm helping these kids get exposure to, you know, a field in science, as long as I'm helping them see that when they see me standing in front of the room and I am in that position to, to teach and to get an advanced degree, as a woman of color, I want them to feel like they can do that too. Um, and so my goals shifted a little bit during that, but it was an incredible experience. I never taught anything before. Um, I don't have any real teaching background. Um, so it was a little bit of a roller coaster for me, but I had a lot of support and help through it. And um, it was just insanely rewarding to be able to see these kids you know, learn something about vet med and actually enjoy it. So I um, actually did end up following up with several of the students afterwards. They would ask me for letters of recommendation or for, you know, to put me down as references. And 
um, they're all going to college. Uh, mm -hmm. They all started college. And so um, I'm really, really proud of them. Um, but it was, it was such a wonderful experience to, to be a part of that. And I just, I felt so good, you know, being able to, to help, help these people understand, you know, what is out there for them. Mm. The passion comes first, Melissa. Uh, <laughs> you, you can learn the skills, uh, but to, to learn the skills without the passion, you don't translate uh, that uh, ability for them to really see you as a role model. Um, so it, 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 it isn't just a, a stand in front of someone kind of an issue, which most folks don't really understand, uh, but it is in what ways are you able to convey your passion about what it is that you do that helps young people see themselves mm -hmm. uh, as being um, aspirationally uh, something that they may not have ever dreamed of before. Uh, and so the passion comes first. Uh, and then after that, you, you can take a course on pedagogy. So, I mean, you, know, <laughs> you, you can do all those other things, uh, but uh, passion and yeah. passion and empathy, cognitive empathy particularly come first in this and then the rest follows. And the rest follows almost effortlessly. You don't even realize that um, you're hooked. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is exactly what happens. Right, Lisa? You get hooked. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that, that you know, um, one of the other valuable lessons in, in your sharing, Melissa, is, you know, certainly we've all seen since last year in the social uprisings after the murder of George, George Floyd, how many folks are, you know, in the profession are like, oh my goodness, though, we have got to do exposure and we got to go into the high schools and we like have to, you know, make everybody a veterinarian, like, you know, and, and, and um, I think a lot of folks kind of go in with that mentality of we will create this cohort of, you know, students who want to be veterinarians. And, you know, I think that, yes, some of them will. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I, I've long also argued that um, black and brown kids and poor kids and country kids and city kids all are also born with the mm -hmm. idea and desire of being a veterinarian, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's no difference there. It's really mm -hmm. a difference in accessibility and opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that, that what you've described and kind of how your own personal goals have pivoted is definitely a lesson for folks in the profession that are interested in working with young people to help those potential mentors understand that, that um, yes, while one of the big goals might be we want to increase the, the pipeline of applicants and, and, and make sure that it's more diverse and reflective and all of those things, that really it is about giving, creating space, creating opportunity, um, creating connection, um, role modeling, um, you know, and really encouraging and nurturing um, folks exactly where they are, right, right where you found them, right. And so, um, so thank you for for sharing that. I think it's a um, it's a powerful lesson that I think we gloss over in our attempts to say, okay, well, we want the pipeline to look like this, so I guess we got to go do these things. <laughs> Right, right. And, you know, I think it's, it's one that is, has, for me at least, been reiterated over the course of my, my veterinary career. Um, you know, as, I don't want to say, as it gets trendy to, you know, add diversity and inclusion to student population, I don't mean to sound, you know, blasé or ungrateful <laughs> for that in any, in any sense of that, but I do think that there needs to be an actual thoughtfulness behind that process and that sometimes sometimes that's lacking and you know I remember the first time that I sat in the lecture hall with my classmates on the very first day of orientation and I remember thinking to myself oh my goodness 
everyone, so first of all, 90% of the population was, of the student population in my class was, uh, was female, presented as female, and they were mostly white. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh my goodness, everyone here, you know, looks the same to me <laughs> and um, feeling a bit out of place and thinking in that moment, what do we need to do to get more people of color and people from different backgrounds and different sexual orientations and different religions and different races and ethnicities into this space. And, you know, the rest of my college or of my vet school career was about administration telling me, you know, how do we get those students here? How do we get them here? How do we entice them? How do we, you know, help that? And that's why I think what you said was so important because it's not it's not necessarily all about drawing people in in that way. It's about being thoughtful when you're advocating for people to, to pursue a certain interest or, or career path. Um, because, you know, it's not necessarily about, okay, give more scholarships, give more, um, you know, promote more in different communities, things like that. It's about, saying, okay, let's step back and look at what about the system that we currently have is actually keeping people from, you know, having access to, you know, veterinary medicine as a career. Is it because of, you know, lack of opportunities when they're younger? Is it because of high cost of admission? Is it because of not having time? to shadow, not having money, to not have a job, to, you know, go volunteer. And it's all of these other things that, that are kind of coming into play. Um, and that's, that's where the issue is. That's where the real problem lies. Um, and if we want to increase diversity in veterinary medicine, you know, funnel more people of color down the pipeline, so to speak, um, it's a matter of addressing those issues. It's not a matter of, you know, sticking a Band-Aid on, on, onto everything, so. Ooh, snap, snap, Melissa is yeah. over here dropping <laughs> gems. <laughs> gems, 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 gems. Yes, and you know, so many points that I could spend the next hour pointing out just, just in, in that response, but, but one that I think is, is important because folks are always, you know, especially for folks of color, oh my goodness, you always are noticing race. Like, yeah, no, we do. And that's not a good or bad thing. It's just a fact. It, <laughs> it, just, it just is. Just it is. is, you know, just like you kind of look around and you're like, oh, there are trees. It's you look around, and, you know, or, or you're taking in, you know, you're just taking in your surroundings, yeah. right? It is one of those factual things that is noticed. And, and it doesn't necessarily, depending on the environment, necessarily result in a value statement or judgment it just is it's called environmental scanning yes uh, it, it is what we all do when we enter into any space yes uh, it just so happens that those of us um, who are generally underrepresented in various populations, whether that's in a committee setting mm -hmm. or in a general population. It's just part of our lens um, that helps calibrate how we behave and how we enter into to that setting. No different than anyone else. Our mm -hmm. calibrations are just different because they have to be. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, that is, it, it just is. It just is. Um, yes. Means, um, and, right. and, and there are various aspects of our identities that, that mm -hmm. do that. We, you know, first gen folks can typically find each other. Yes. We don't necessarily have to have the baseball cap on saying first gen, but yes. usually we can find each other, right? City kids can find each other. Country kids can find each other. It is just a part of this, yes, environmental scanning that is just actual factual okay cool now I can you know go do what I'm gonna do so we're running up on time and but I want to ask you so we know that you're in grad school yeah. because you know you're one of those folks that likes I can't school. get out of education <laughs> <laughs> my parents are like when are you actually gonna have a real job <laughs> So, so, you know, you clearly, you know, as, as, as 
Pat mentioned, you know, you had an interest in some um, international things, you've got interest in domestically. So, you know, in the next chapter, unless the next chapter is also a PhD, in the next chapter. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Definitely um, you know, not. what's 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 uh what's on the horizon for you? Um so yeah, so after um, getting my, my master's in public health, which by the way, I, I just want to mention that um, my sister, she is a third year medical school student here at UW. She's also taking a year for her MPH. So we are in the same cohort and I'm super excited. Um, firstly, because I don't think we've been in a class together since AP English in high school. And secondly, we're, we're very close and I'm very curious to see how us two from different backgrounds are going to see the curriculum and you know talk about that information um so yeah so that'll be kind of an exciting thing to to look forward to but once the master's is completed i think um you know at that point i am either going to go into general practice or pursue an internship of like just a small animal rotating internship it kind of depends on you know what my partner is doing work-wise and where we decide to, to settle down. Um, I really, really love conservation medicine. I love working with special species, with exotic species. Um, and so if I can find some way of integrating that um, into a, a career in the future, um, you know, something like working for the Nature Conservancy or for the Marine Mammal Center or something like that. Um, I would love, love for that opportunity. Um, and I think that'd be a good tie of, you know, public health and clinical medicine. So that's kind of my dream. <laughs> very, very cool. Um, I bet both your parents are anxiously looking forward to that graduation. Like what are both of y'all getting jobs? <laughs> yes, right. No, they, they totally are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's really exciting. And, um, you know, how, you know, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, I think you've got a bright future ahead of you. And I, we, I think that we're all just anxiously waiting to see what you're going to do next. Thank you. Yeah, I, I may not have an exact name for what I want to do, but I have a vision and I have a dream and I am an extremely motivated, very independent person. I will get there. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned before, I'm going to do some pretty cool things. I'm going to do some big things and I'm really excited to, you know, share that with you guys. <laughs> well, I, I think um, our audience now appreciates um, the, um, uh, the recommendations, the nominations, and the selection of, of you as this year's recipient. Um, very, very worthy uh, and a very thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, new professional um, that's going to, to be the change agent um, that we are talking about for the future. Congratulations all around. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. And we look forward to, to seeing, uh, seeing you in the future. Um, yeah. So exciting. Thank you so much. Uh, thank for, so much for, for having this me. Hour. Yeah. Thanks so much for spending this hour. Um, it was uh, well worth the wait. Yes. Yes. It yes. Well worth the wait. I'm, I'm so glad that we could still make this happen. Still have this conversation. Oh. I, hope that we can have more in the future <laughs> absolutely absolutely i i predict you'll be doing big things so uh, and you know don't worry about what the title is like i'll you know my, my parents only figured out what i was doing and for a living like 10 years ago <laughs> so it'll be okay <laughs> it'll be okay it'll all work out <laughs> so this has been another episode of AABMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air to my guests, Pat and Melissa. Thank you so much for spending time with me chatting this evening. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube, and be sure to like and follow us on uh, 
Facebook. Um, the podcast page is AVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air Podcast. Uh, we will be back with another show soon. Thanks so much. Thanks Thank for having you. us, Lisa. Bye-bye.